Tim, I've been obsessed with consciousness my whole life. On the one hand, it seems very simple. On the other hand, everybody has all these crazy definitions. What is consciousness? What is consciousness? That's, that's such a great question, Robert. It's a, it's a difficult question. It's so hard to answer. I, I think there are three ways in, um, in into thinking about what consciousness is. Uh, and each of them gets you a little way, but even taken together, they don't get you very far. It's, it's frustrating. Um, one way in is the use of synonyms, something like synonyms, um, so we can talk about experience, uh, awareness. Um, uh, we can use the phrase that Tom Nagel made very popular, uh, although I believe it was Wittgenstein who, who first used it in connection with consciousness, the what it's likeness. So there's a what it's likeness to consciousness. The problem with the use of synonyms is uh, one can be as puzzled as to what they mean as, as what consciousness means. And sometimes people talk about conscious awareness as though that helps, okay. but that just doubles the problem, really, I think. Um, we'll, we'll come back to what it's like this in a second. The second way in to, to, to explicating the notion of, of what consciousness is is via the use of paradigms, examples, exemplars. So if you say, what is, you know, you, you're, you're new to the society and someone says, you're talking about fish, you know, what does this word mean? And you say, well, that's a fish. You give them a salmon, you give them a trout, right? Um, and we can do that with consciousness uh, in some sense by pointing inwards, um, which is part of the problem because I can only point inwards to my own mind. It's a little bit harder to point inwards to yours, but I can direct your attention so what would to you features say, of the world. The, the, the sight of red or the smell of cheese. Exactly. And it's, it's fascinating that you use those particular examples. And, and those are the kinds of examples that people use. So if you look at all the classic texts, um, in, in this literature, there are sensory states. Um, red comes up all the time. Bodily sensations come up all the time. Pains, itches, uh, tickles, tingles. Um, cheese comes up. Why, why this focus on sensory states is a very interesting question because most of us think that thoughts can also mm -hmm. be conscious. Um, so you and I can both be sitting here and um, suppose there's an explosion out in the street, and we might both have to talk, well, what was that? And various hypotheses might come, you know, maybe a fire truck ran into a, uh, a hydrant or something like that. Um, that's a conscious thought, and it's not obviously a sensory state. Um, it's not the sensation of red, it's not the smell of cheese, it's mm -hmm. something cognitive. And it may be verbalized in your head, or it may be not verbalized. Well, that's a debate. That's mm -hmm. a real live debate. It was, a, it was a debate a hundred years ago <laughs> with introspectionists mm -hmm. uh, as to whether all thoughts are verbalized. Um, it's kicking around again now. Um, and in part it's kicking around because people don't know how far to extrapolate beyond the paradigms, these exemplars. So when, when folks try and explain what they're working on when they're working on consciousness, mm. they start where you started, which is sensations Sensory. of red, bodily sensations and all that, the sensory states. And then they think to themselves, well, how does thought fit in? If I want a full theory of consciousness, mm. I want a theory that accommodates, that accounts for all types of conscious states. Um, and here they've got a question. I mean, th there's a question that faces them. Do they say there's more than one type of thing they're studying? So do they say consciousness is equivocal, ambiguous? Mm. Do they say, well, we talk about conscious thought and we talk about conscious sensation, but really we're using the word consciousness in different ways. That's one view out there. Uh, another view out there would be there's one fundamental notion here. There's one unitary thing. Uh, and sensations have that property. Thoughts can have that property. Thoughts as such independent of inner speech or mm -hmm. visualization or, or what have you. It's hard to resolve. Uh, introspection, it's not clear how far introspection gets you on, on that topic. Let's go um, to the third, so I have go, the whole yeah. picture. So that was the second, and we can chase that down a bit. The third is, and this is often what one sees in science, uh, where you have, you have something like a starting definition, which you might get from synonyms or paradigms. Um, mm -hmm. But you rely on your theory to really tell you the borders of the concept. Mm. Um, with, with, with biological notions like mammal or fish, you know, we, these are common sense words that we use before the science of biology, zoology really got going. Um, 
and people would talk about fish or talk about mammals. Um, we've got exemplars. Um, so, you know, we know that a lion is not a fish. We know that a trout's a fish. But there might be lots of unclear cases. Uh, and then you get a theory. You get a taxonomy. You get an account of how different forms of life are related to each other. And you say, well, given that, it makes sense to use the word fish for these things. So your definition falls out of your theory. That's, that's a fundamental insight from philosophy of science, I think. And you go from particulars to the general you, to the theory to the definition. Exa ex exactly. Is that the flow? That's exactly, that's, that's, that's exactly right. But you can't do that until you've got a theory that everyone's happy with. <laughs> and, of course, you need enough agreement on the particulars to get the theory, yeah. right? Because if, if I'm someone who says the consciousness is really sensory, it's perceptual. There's no really purely distinctively cognitive consciousness. Um, if that's my view, um, and, and that's a position I call a kind of a conservative conception, or if you like, a conservative conception of phenomenal consciousness, because the kind of people use this term yeah. phenomenal consciousness to try and identify the, the thing that they're most interested and, and in. And phenomenal means that you have an awareness of it, or to go to the synonyms, well, this, what it's like to feel like it's that inner sensation. That, that's the word phenomenal. That's, that's exactly right. So uh, phenomenal got used in this literature um, largely, I think, due to, to the work of Ned Block, who said it's, it's what it's likeness consciousness. So um, it's difficult to define it. We can give these rough synonyms. We can give these paradigms. And then he gave the paradigms for phenomenal consciousness that, that we were talking about before. Mm -hmm. And so then the question is, OK, uh, we're interested in phenomenal consciousness. Is thought a form of phenomenal mm -hmm. consciousness? Mm -hmm. So suppose I'm a kind of a what this position which I've dubbed conservatism, um, and I say, no, it's not, and, and you're what I would call a liberal, and you say, yeah, there's a what it's likeness to thinking that the accident had a specific cause, and that's, a, that's, that's got a distinctive phenomenology. Um, then when we go to develop our theories, we've got very different evidence bases. The, the mm -hmm. data that we're using are very different. Um, we might hit on the same underlying theory of what phenomenal consciousness is, but we might not. Um, and so theoretically driven definitions, that's what we would like, but we might struggle. We might struggle to get there given the degree of uncertainty and obscurity. So with these is. three ways to go after consciousness, what, what are some of the ultimate definitions that people come to? How, however they they deal with the, their um, methods to get there. So let's just look a little bit at the landscape of the, the end result. What are, what are some of the different definitions out there, uh, in, including what, what you, I, I want to know what you, you, will, you believe as well. Let me start, start with my, my, my take. Uh, my view is that we don't, we're not really in a position to advance theories of any detail with any degree of certainty. Um, the science of consciousness is so immature, um, and there's so many fundamental disputes. I think what we should be looking for are, are constraints on a theory. So what we need to find are very general properties of consciousness. Um, and once we've got those, then we're going to be in a better position to find um, the underlying theories. We're going to be in a better position to know whether consciousness is fundamentally a matter of bringing information together in the mind, or whether it's fundamentally a matter of disseminating and dispersing information. Some would say that just indicates you don't know what you're talking about. There's a fundamental sense in which we don't know what we're talking about. I think we, we need to be honest. Um, but we can still make progress. I mean, we are making progress inch by inch, I think. It's often the case that you really only really know how much progress you've made in, in historical hindsight. We, we hope that we're heading in a, in, a, in a direction where we're making progress with the science and the, the philosophical understanding of consciousness. Um, but it might be that we're in a local maxima, I think it's called. So that, you know, we're, 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 we're in a rut. We're, go, we're going up, or at least we think we're going up. But in fact, actually, in order to get to the top, we need to go down and back, back up over here.